how was the uh, clarity on this on the live stream? It's a little low. It's what? It's a little rough. Yeah. It's a little rough? Yeah. I could, I tried to move it a little closer, but these aren't on caster, so I don't want to like drag it. Oh, you tried doing it with Zoom? Because my, um, I was picking professors in Zoom and it was like a lot better than you did. Yeah, well, the reason I do that is so that way I can easy, more easily save these to YouTube, so that way they can restrain. Oh, yeah. You know, they can be, it's, so it's just a little bit easier that way. Um, I mean, the camera's still the same. The only difference that I, you know, is that I obviously don't have the, you know, this projected on that. It's, you know, it's projected up there and the camera looking up at it, but. Is this like locked or? Oh, it is. Okay, it's locked. Yep, nope, I can't. Bring it up a hair. And hopefully that makes it easier. And you know, the objective too is for you guys to just, you know, be able to still hear it and follow along in that way. Because then I, I upload obviously because of the lectures as they are after. So I'll, I'll try to make sure I do that tonight. You know, Friday, Saturday, obviously, you know, I do it like Friday. So anyway, I said, hold on, I just want to be clear. This is three or four. This is the last one. It's okay. it's All right, well, welcome to the final lecture of the Power, Authority, and Government series. Oh, hey. Put my key on. Um, today we're going to talk about revolutions. The only two that we're going to really talk about are the um, United States Revolution and the French Revolution. Um, and it's, and there are actually like four kind of major revolutions of this era. The third one is the Haitian Revolution, uh, which is it kind of, at, that's kind of the big three. It's the U.S., French, and Haitian. We don't really talk about the Haitian. Uh, and actually the uh, Irish Revolution is also kind of another big one. So this era can almost be called the Atlantic Revolution, just because obviously the United States was an Atlantic coastal nation, England, uh, excuse me, not England, uh, French Atlantic coast, Ireland, totally submerged in, Atlantic, uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, and then not so French, but uh, isolated within as an island, and then same with Haiti. Um, but again, we're only going to talk about the big two, that made the United States and French. So with the U.S., I'm going to kind of fly through it, because I'm going to work under the assumption that We've all been taking the United States history since you know kindergarten, pretty much know all the ins and outs. So uh, there will be slides with maybe a lot of information that I'm going to just like kind of hit in two or three moments, you know, just whether that's two or three seconds, 10, 20 seconds, one minute, whatever. Try to move through it quickly. The French I'll slow down a little bit on, uh, but again, um, just kind of the purposes of making connections, I'll hit on some slides more than others. Uh, and again, whatever, just, you know, something you're like, if, first off, if I say something or fly through something, um, I'm going to try to keep the pace very um, kind of achievable for you guys. I'm not trying to, like, throw you under the bus or anything. So if I ever do anything too fast, like, wait, what in the world did you just talk about? I'll stop. And that's not a good deal. So just let me know. Um, I'm just trying to say, like, keep the pace up. But then if there's also stuff that's like, you know, I hit on a little bit, I give you the main topic, and you're like, oh, well, is there more on there? Just flip through it when I upload the lecture, you know, take a few extra moments. Plus, I'm going to give you, as you guys know, I have the, if you want to learn more, I've got movies and lectures and textbooks and stuff for you guys to tap into. So if you do want to learn more about the French Revolution, the American Revolution, that kind of thing, so the key figures, I give you a chance to, you know, I give you that information in terms of the secondary outlet. So, again, Power and Authority and Government series ends today. Also, that means that this time next week, or at least when this class ends next week, we are officially halfway through the semester. Um, so we are, we're almost there. It's crazy to think, but we're literally almost halfway there. So this assignment, uh, that you're coming up to, that you'll finish here on Monday or have turned in by Monday is three of seven, which means three down, four to go. Um, so then when we finish up with the fourth assignment, which is now about two weeks and two days away, two weeks and three days away, I guess that will be four down, three to go. We'll be 
over the hump and on uh, on the way home. With of course the final two weeks of the semester being at home, uh, we transitioned back to the Zoom class for the final couple of weeks. If you guys didn't remember that, um, obviously it's to give students a chance to travel home and you know be as safe as they can. Set so like we are we're pushing through. I think it's it's kind of fun. I kind of like the speed sometimes, but. I also then get to know you guys, and right as I really get to know everybody, then you guys go on your, your merry little way. So, um, either way, we're moving along quickly. So, let's rock and roll. All right, so today we're going to analyze the concept of nationalism, and we're going to do so through the description of two revolutions. So, the age of revolution is 1776 to 1799. This is obviously the era. The United States is the first major revolution of this time period, but again, it encompasses the two big ones, that being the United States and France. And the France obviously kind of fell on the heels of the United States. You know, and remember last week when I kind of said that, that Martin Luther was the incidental revolutionary? Like, he had no intention of starting new denominations of Christianity. The Protestant Reformation simply stands for, from his original perspective, that being, I'm protesting the problems that I see, that being Martin Luther and the Catholic Church, and in particular the sale of indulgences, and I'm looking to reform the church. He's looking to clean up what he felt were, you know, some issues within the Catholic Church. He wasn't trying to start new denominations. Uh, as I referenced the idea of, you know, being a Lutheran, that being a follower of Martin Luther, while he was still a Catholic monk, he felt he found insulting because he's like, don't, you know, I'm not Christ. I'm not trying to start a church. The Catholic Church is the only denomination in the history of Christianity that Christ physically started. It's like, I am trying to do something different here. I'm trying to reform the church through these negative protests. Well, the French Revolution, which we'll get into second, the French Revolution was kind of the incidental revolution. They didn't really, you know, the, the revolutionaries didn't really mean to, to cause the chaos that they ultimately caused. And Boy, when that chaos began, they just ran headlong into it. It's like, okay, things are getting nuts. Let's see if we can turn that nuts, you know, volume knob up to 11. And they did. Uh, but it was always the incidental revolution. They didn't, uh, the revolution didn't begin. Something goes, well, the Americans revolted, so now let's revolt too. It was more coincidence than anything. Um, and, and again, we're going to get into the details of it. But the American Revolution truly was the first, like, they were the first people in, in history was where, they, they kind of look around like, it's got to happen. We have to make this change, and we've got to do it now. So what are the primary connections um, between the two revolutions were some of those leaders? Um, and in particular, uh, French General Lafayette. French General Lafayette was a very important uh, military assistant to George Washington and the American Revolutionary effort. And when the war ended, um, George Washington became kind of this, this big popular figure in France, even though he never visited his life. He never crossed the Atlantic once in his life. Um, and so the two kind of exchanged sort of gifts, if you will. Uh, Washington got a portrait of him that went up in what would eventually become essentially the, the French legislature. He's got a portrait of him uh, 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 up there, whereas Lafayette presented George Washington with the key to the Bastille. Now, we're going to get into the, to the story of the Bastille here in a little bit, but there it is right here. Uh, it no longer stands. It was destroyed during the French Revolution for a very particular reason. It housed re political revolutionaries. Uh, it housed prisoners um, traditionally, but then during the war, during the revolution, political revolutionaries were thrown in there. It also was an armory that had, uh, you know, obviously a, a big um, stack of of weapons that the revolutionaries wanted their hands on to help them assist in their fight. Well, one day, as the story goes, one day the uh, revolution reached the doors of the Bastille, and there was a French general who was, you know, kind of basically oversaw the armory and, and the people inside and said, uh, and so the revolutionaries came to the door and they had some leadership and said, you know, hey, we want those, those weapons. And the general's like, Ugh, I can't do that. You know, it's treason. Got to respect the king. Why don't you guys come in? We'll have some tea and we'll discuss. So these revolutionary, this revolutionary leadership went in. They had tea. They discussed. And essentially, what it was was, listen. But they came to us. The general's like, I can't give those arms. I'm not going to commit treason against the king. Um, 
but I also won't use those weapons against you. I'll, you know, I'll play, you know, as we kind of reference, I'll play neutral here in this case, I'll play Switzerland. You can't have them, but I also won't use them against you, I'll keep them locked up. And the revolutionaries were like, okay, well that's at least, you know, we can deal with that. Well, to kind of see, there are some windows in the Bastille. And then those windows could be placed cannons. And in this case, there were cannons that were in the windows. You know, they didn't fire, but, you know, they, there was no call to fire. And so the revolutionary leadership comes out. They're like, yeah, they're not going to give it to us, but they're not going to fire on us, you know. Well, then, in it, as a sign of peace, the general pulls, has the weapon, as the, excuse me, the cannons pull from the windows. Well, some of the revolutionaries thought, He's pulling those things to load them, fire on us. So the revolutionaries and their mob got all out, rushed in, murdered everybody, took the weapons, and burned the whole place down. One of the things that survived was, and, be, and this became then a kind of, this was their like Boston Massacre, where the, if you, we'll discuss it in a moment, Boston Massacre wasn't, you know, the, 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 the um, uh, British Redcoats didn't actually like fire on those, uh, those citizens like willy nilly. They, the, the soldiers that were guarding the courthouse in Boston Common, they, you know, they were just doing the job. They were just guarding this courthouse because it was British federal property. And this mob came and started riling up and, and kind of attacked them. And they, these British soldiers were given the order not to fire. Somebody fires. Nobody actually knows on what side nor who. But the first crack sounds and the rest of the soldiers in their fear, skittish moment, they all then fire on the crowd they kill a few people, including Crispus Atkins, a free black slave, a uh, former slave, obviously, who became the first death. And so that of the revolution. And so that moment then gets spun as, look, the British are firing on us, on our people. Well, in this case, the Bastille is kind of the same way. The general had no intention of firing on the citizens. And the general was trying to play peaceful and say, hey, I'll pull the cannons from the windows. But the mob took it as a sign of the loading the cannons to fire on us. So they went in, and the spirit of political spirit was then what kind of then became this great monk for both revolutions. So the Bastille itself became this, this good kind of rallying cry for revolutionaries. And the key, which is one of the few things that, was, that survived the demolition of this building, was then given to George Washington as a gift of friendship between this new French government and the new American government. Well, the key was given specifically to Washington. It wasn't given to the federal government. So I actually went to Washington's home, this estate, Mount Vernon. Over time, it, got, it, it was lost, and then it was finally found like for decades, and it was finally found by some historians who stopped finding the storage. They're like, oh my gosh, this is, that was a gift. And so now it hangs in Washington's house. I've never, has anybody ever been to Mount Vernon? So, you know, you walk in, and like, this is the foyer. You walk into like the, the main, first main room, and it hangs right here. Um, and so now it's, which is not where Washington place, it's just where his, you know, the, his estate footage to kind of show it off. So actually when I was there, this whole thing was pulled down because the, the house and the casing was like falling apart. So when I, I went to visit them about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, give or take, um, and that wasn't there, but it now hangs back up there because they re-solidified the housing. But what, you know. What happened? Those were the two kind of connective moments, these like rally cries, the Boston Massacre, the, the steel, and then Washington having his portrait um, hung in the legislature and the, the parliament and the, the steel being placed in Washington's home. All right, what say you? Turn to your neighbors, social distance, and answer this question. What is a revolution and why do they occur? Social distance like the neighbors. I just said, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so just so you guys remember, in order for participation points to count, you have to have not only the what they use, but you have to have the notes throughout as well. You have to show that you follow through the entire lecture. So when you email it to me, make sure that you've got notes as well as these. Now these don't have to be like full paragraph responses. They can be a sentence or two. And just show that you gave me a thoughtful answer, but you gotta give notes as well. All right. Yes, it is 
and everyone. In my U.S. history class, this chair was on like another foot. I like being up higher to so get a better bird's eye view. This one is solid up. All right, so I say, what is a revolution and why do they occur? Who's got, who's got a proud definition I want to share? Um, Let's start again. I guess the revolution would be uh, a certain group of people wanting to bring about change to get a change in the status quo in uh, an organized sort of revolt. Okay, so yeah, you used the prefix of it. Yeah, very good. So, okay, so it's an organized movement of people who want to bring about significant change to something in yeah. particular. Very good. What else? Does a revolution have to be violent? No. It does not have to be violent. Uh, does it have to be simply against the government? No. Um, have there been any, been any revolutions in your lifetime? Yeah. What do you think? Where or how? Uh, the Egyptian one. The Egyptian revolution, the uh, Muslim Spring? Or, yeah. The Arab it's not Arab Spring, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Any others? Yeah. I guess on a small scale, you can count like the Black Lives Matter. Like those types of protests that are happening around the world. Okay. I think you can count those in like a more rudimentary way. Like I would straight up be like, we're not in the midst of a revolution. Like, I think it's definitely revolutionary. Yeah. Mm. Does an act, does that group have to succeed to be called a revolution or to be called revolutionary? If you fail, are you still a revolutionary? I don't think you're going to be revolutionary, but you can have attempted a revolution. Mm -hmm. Revolutionary has the implication that it is succeeded. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can still have attempted a revolution. However, you have to have succeeded in order to, to be firmly you know, uh, denoted. That isn't the word I want to use, but to be from categorized as a revolution. Anybody else? I feel like I have hair on them. Do we all kind of have a come to an agreement in regards to all of these definitions? This all seems pretty fair, firm, solid, no uh, gray area, no questionable sides to that definition. All right. Well, kind of as a, as a similarity but, uh, between of revolution and why they occur. You always kind of see an overthrow of power of some kind. Now again, as Ian was saying, like it doesn't necessarily have to be a government. It could be an idea. It could be the power behind an idea that at least on that kind of level is revolutionary. And these events lead to extremists. To be revolutionary, you're obviously not part of, as Ian noted, a status quo. You are part of an outside group of people. You are an outside thinker. You think uh, apart from what the general consensus might be. Um, these, in order, so again, then, as Basil was saying, in order to be revolutionary, truly de you know, uh, defined as revolutionary, you have to have been successful. 
So these extremists then have to come to power, and then eventually this revolution subsists or succeeds, you know, uh, slides into a more moderate time, which essentially just means that this revolutionary thought now becomes the status quo, and with that status quo essentially comes peace. So a metaphor could be, uh, and this was written pretty good, by the way, but a metaphor could be that a fever that rises due to the complaints among the people and then a breakdown of body power. So the, the virus uh, injects itself in the body, or is brought in the body, and the fever that rises as this kind of, uh, kind of war breaks out. The fever rages, it is made clear that the people cannot tolerate the fever, the body of people cannot tolerate the fever, and this rage is then replaced with an improved body of power, which in, in the case of a virus would be antibodies that can protect itself from uh, future infection, and therefore a happier people. Not only are you happier because on a, you know, on a micro sense, on a macro sense, we're obviously talking about societally, on a micro sense, not only happier, it's head and healthy, getting my energy back, I've got my taste and smell back, but then you're also kind of, you recognize on a natural sense, I've got those antibodies that can kind of fight that off. And on a, mic on a macro level, you've got enough of the new status quo to fight off any of those kind of like insurgents who are maybe trying to reexert that prior thought back in the body. So, or get to the society's vision. So all societies have tensions and signs of discontent. Uh, an example would be the United States during the Great Depression of the 1930s. Not only are millions of people out of work, millions of people flat broke, but there's labor unrest, there's high unemployment, there's terrible crime, and there are attacks on civil liberties as a result of all of this. So here in the 1930s, like, there might have been a chance based on the number of people out of work and out of money and literally starving in the streets that could have led to one. One can hypothetically look at the history of the 1930s and say, wow, there kind of might have there might have been all the workings there for one, and yet it didn't occur. So why then did it occur in 18th century France, 18th century America, and 20th century Russia, yet it didn't occur in 1930s, 20th century America? Or now let's take the last view. Why hasn't there been one? I know that you reference BLM as a potential revolutionary kind of organization, but there has not been anything on a national scale societal scale, even though we have lockdowns, we have racial violence, we have high, high, high unemployment, we have mandates, um, all these things, we have an election that is contested, all of this, and yet no revolution. Why is it that in the 1930s and 2020s, there was none, and yet there was in 18th century France, 18th century America, 20th century, 19th century, yeah, 20th century Russia, excuse me. Any thoughts? Why is in the last hundred years the United States has gone through all these potentially catastrophic events and yet consistently, at least through 2021, early 2021, come out unified? Because despite there being hard times, there's still stuff for those people to lose. Despite there being hard times, there's still stuff for people to lose. And, and when you say stuff, I'm assuming you mean like the, the physical, tangible, yeah, their homes, their livelihoods. Like that. Say that one more time. Governmental protection. They still have governmental protection. Yeah. yeah. They're what? They did have, yeah, well, certainly the wealthy. I mean, this, that, the leadership of that war the American side specifically, because um, that's not entirely accurate the French Revolution, but the American side, it was very much uh, a wealthy led or a wealth led group. Um, I mean, there wasn't a single poor person among the revolutionaries. There might have been richer people, but for sure. So they too had a lot to lose. So then, why is it then that they were willing to take that lead and take that step towards revolution, but in the last hundred years, that hasn't happened? Yeah. I think like the advancement in technology just from having because like in 18th century France and 18th century America, we didn't really have like a wealth of knowledge. 
to us, like we knew, even in like the 30s, compared to like 18th century, uh -huh. like America, like the technology just advanced so much that people just got complacent. It, it didn't seem as drastic oh. of, a, of a need for like a task. Okay, so technology led to complacency, which then led to a willingness to accept the negatives brought upon them, but brought upon them by their, well, hypothetically, you know, by their, their leadership. Yeah. So does that mean in a modern sense, a revolution is impossible? Maybe? I wouldn't say impossible, but I don't think that it would get anywhere near close to like, like us straight up just murdering our government officials. You know? Sure. That's one. Uh, I'd say that based on like how also technology and warfare has developed, if there were to be a revolution, it would probably be the same kind of warfare. It would just be like you know, people getting living themselves in the street or people going and get their government officials. Like today, um, I kind of forget the uh, the name of war, but I think it's called I think the fourth or fifth international warfare, which is basically the warfare of information, where most countries already just buy over information rather than just who's on the ground warfare. So it would probably be more of a war of uh, getting the people, uh, getting into the people's minds rather than just physical con confrontation. Fascinating. Fascinating. So it'd be, the, the, the war might be raging, the revolution might be occurring, but it's occurring in the minds of citizens, not in the streets, you know, not physical fighting, it's mental fighting or, you know, informational fighting. And I think, I think it's fourth generation, because if I recall correctly, fifth generation is AI or cyborg. Pretty sure it's something to effect. I think so. I think the information is the fourth generation. Very good. So many theories in regards to revolution itself exist, um, but they do not always explain what happened in the United States. And we're talking 1776. So one assumed necessary ingredient of revolution is widespread discontent. And that is certainly what occurred in France. That is that. There's a great percentage of the population who are just not happy with their with their livelihood, not just their government, but with their lives in general. Yet in the United States, well, I shouldn't say United States, but in the American colonies, it was in general, every American was in general pretty well off. The American colonists, on a you know comparative scale to other citizens around the world, were wealthy. They were well to do. They had space. There was no widespread famine. Everybody had food. There was plenty more of it to, to go around. Um, everybody had an opportunity. Obviously, you know, when I say everybody was in a generic sense, because yes, there were both racial and, and um, gender inequalities, but regardless, I mean, even, even again, on a look, you know, comparing to the rest of the world, even they, those minorities, were better off in the United States and had more opportunity than anywhere else in the planet. So revolutions do have the tent to have one thing in particular, or excuse me, do tend to have certain things in common. And one necessity is that they start with discontent of some sort. So while most American colonists were wealthy, weren't starving, you know, they, they however, did have uh, issues with government that made them comfortable believe that they were oppressed. Um, but it's not always clear to what extent wrongs are real or proceed. So it's interesting to note that four American, four major revolutions, the American, the English, the American, French, and Russian, all began with governments trying to get more money out of the people for one race or another. It all had to do with heavy, heavy taxation. To which I say, if taxation is the driving factor, again, why hasn't the United States had a revolution in the 20th century? We now are higher taxed by an incredible number than the American colonists were in the 1770s. Um, and they're gonna have, the federal government's gonna have to start taxing more because of how much they're adding to debt uh, as we speak. Eventually, I mean, debts come due, and the federal government, they print money to pay for debt, it causes hyperinflation, which means our money is less value, that's a terrible thing. So the best way to do it is to like physically pay it off with our earnings, and so taxes are gonna have to rise. So if taxation is often the driving factor, why, again, hasn't the United States had a revolution in the 20th century? Or now the 21st century, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, taxes are one, and then you have the taxes, but versus uh, when the colonies were ruled by the king, the 
those the king wasn't put into power by the people who elected, which is now the people that make the taxation laws are elected by the people, which then lead to uh, essentially as the constitution states is the government's full people by the people. Okay, so because we select we, we I should say elect the people who write the tax law we are more apt to accept it because we, in essence, placed them there. They weren't placed there without our consent. What else? Very good, Ian. Uh, I like when you said before, the, uh, one of the assumed ingredients is widespread discontent. I just don't think that the US has seen that kind of widespread discontent, like relatively, tend to say 50, 50 on the huge. Like, it hasn't been this widespread discontent toward government yet. Mm -hmm. We generally have like a, oh, I don't like my government, but we don't have like a, this government is tyrannical. We don't have 70% of the population saying that our government is somehow in the wrong. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it might hit like 40%, 30%, but we don't have well, that widespread discontent. You know, the great irony is it was about 40 to 45% of the American population that was pro-revolution in, in the 1770s. And so they, now I, I have to preface that with they didn't do polling back then. So that percentage is something that historians have come on by reading newspapers and letters and, and those and diary entries, that kind of thing. But they've kind of extrapolated from that information. It's only about 40, 45%. Then it was then about 35% who was like, Ed, I don't care who wins, you know, just so long as I don't, my livelihood isn't destroyed. And the rest were, were the loyalists. So about let's see what maybe about forty seven, about twenty to thirty percent based on the population. But regardless, it wasn't seventy percent of the American population that felt so disenfranchised and disaffected that they believed um, they needed revolution. It was only about, about forty to forty five percent. You know, that said, I don't know if those numbers are relatively um, if it's a fair kind of percentage to place on the American population now based on the different situation, but still, I mean, just based on the numbers that you brought, brought up, um, that was the numbers then. So, um, anybody else? If taxation is the issue. Now, the one thing I will say though, on, in regards to taxation though, is that I do think that you need probably above 50% today of a population to really change tax law in a significant way, and we don't have that. We, we really have, we might have a lot of people who are, you know, like, okay with higher taxes, a lot of people who aren't, but it really is, it's over 50% one way or the other. Um, and I do think because of that, we probably would need a significant change in, in popular thought in order to kind of create something truly dramatic in terms of taxes. Then. Anybody else? Also, uh, back then, there wasn't as many like, governmental like, uh, things that they gave people. Whereas like today, there's uh, social security, oh. things like that, all those extra things. That yeah, they're buying the complacency. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, there was no social security. I mean, that, by definition, hence the prefix of social. I mean, that is, is, it is in essence socialism because it's the government taking money from some people to give to other people and spreading it out on air quote even level. Yeah, they didn't have any of that kind of stuff. I mean, it was, it was taxed to pay off debt. It wasn't taxed to then give back to you or or kind of try to balance the levels of, of um, financial or economic inequalities. So that is about it. In essence, yeah, well, if we go to war, we overthrow the government, I lose my Social Security. I lose my Medicare, Medicaid. I lose my um, you know, housing loans. I lose my banking, you know, my, my uh, school loans. They're all federally protected. You, you lose your federal protection uh, in the banks because um, you've got federal, the FDIC is the Federal Insurance Corporation. So our corporation. Anyway, it's, it's, I don't need this corporation. Regardless, $250,000 are insured by the federal government. So yeah, you do lose all that potentially, um, which might cause people to be a little bit more eerie, leery about revolting. Isn't it? They lose what the government's giving them. Very good. All right, so quickly looking at the American Revolution. Again, I do kind of want to fly through this. Uh, so some of the great says the Navigation Acts are a number of them. The Crown appointed governors that governors weren't elected. The Crown appointed governors to decide when the legislatures would meet or if not just to dissolve them entirely as so people didn't really have local control over their governments. The courts were all controlled by the kings. 
Uh, you had a number of colonial lords, King, uh, King William, Queen Anne, King George, then the French and Indian, also into the, the Seven Years' War. Um, and it was the Seven Years' War that really in particular is what led to the taxes that would kind of be the impetus for American Revolution. You know, simply because the, you know, the King of Parliament were like, you know, hey, that war was primarily fought in your land. We need to keep the army there to protect you from further, you know, blah, blah, blah. So we need to fund this. And so then they started to just tax the colonists and yada, yada, yada. We had George Rainbow of the Stamp Act, the Currency Act of 1764, excuse me, which prevented colonists from printing money, which devalued the British pound. You had the Quartering Act, which is a direct um, descendant of the Third Amendment, which is that the military cannot uh, be housed, forcefully housed in your home in the event there is a standing army in your town. Then there was the idea of, as Basil was referencing, the idea of virtual representation. Um, the American colonists didn't have representation in the parliament the way Americans have in our Congress today. Um, and the, the phrase of virtual representation is because what the parliament said to the American colonists who complained, you know, hey, we don't have representation. Like, if you give us representatives in parliament who can vote on taxes, We'll accept it. Like, just give us a voice. And the virtual side is the parliament's and the king's responses. Well, don't worry about it. We've got your best interests in mind. Hence, why it's virtual representation. It's like, you know, we, we, we're, we care for you. We're thinking about you. We got your back. You know, while in the meantime, they really are. They, they're still not taking Colin's opinions into uh, account. Then, so you do have the protest, which leads to the field of stamp back, which then further protests lead to the Townsend Acts. Uh, then you have the Revenue Act of 1767, and overall, the ideological response is, of course, just this fight against tyranny. You know, it's just the fact that, listen, the British government's doing all these things, we don't have a voice, we don't have an opportunity to, to um, kind of voice our own opinions and kind of select their, or decide on how our future will be. Make sure we have phones, by the way, guys. Um, and so because of that, then the colonists are like, oh, hey, it's tyranny. And if you think about it, that kind of is then by definition tyranny, and that is other people telling you what to do. And you're not having a voice in it, and certainly on a political societal level. And so, and I do think in the end, why is it the United States hasn't revolted over the last century, even though kind of by you know statistics, we are far more air quote oppressed, at least you know, in terms of taxes and stuff that other generations were. And it's because we don't have virtual, we have literal representation. As Basil was referencing, we put the people in Congress who are raising our taxes. There is no necessarily no, no there isn't necessarily tyranny of any kind because they're there by our vote. They're not tyrannical because we put them there and we can elect them out. You know, so that those are the two issues, the two kind of political issues, and we don't have those uh, today. Then, of course, as I referenced, there is the spin of the Boston Massacre as there was the spin, the political spin of the Boston Massacre as there was the political spin of the Storming of Bastille. Uh, I'm not going to show it here, but just so you guys know, when I upload this to LabCloud again, I'll try to do it tonight, but otherwise it'll be tomorrow for sure. Um, last year, last March, was the 250-year anniversary of the Boston Massacre. And so apparently in Boston Common, every year, uh, a group of uh, reenactors reenact the Boston Massacre. Well, last year, the 250-year anniversary, it was kind of a big deal. Uh, the funny thing is that the courthouse that the one first soldier was originally protecting no longer stands. Uh, it was torn down forever ago, and now there's other stuff there. But the place is, is still kind of in memoriam. There's a big round plaque that this is the place, you know, the building was here, but it's now something else. So they kind of put up this little outhouse <laughs> looking thing. Uh, I would show it to you, but the video is seven minutes long. I don't want to take that time. However, uh, they do a really cool job of reenacting it. It looks quite real. The only difference is they're not throwing snowballs and stones and stuff. It's it's all just like kind of pushing and shoving. Um, but the one funny thing to me about it is the fact that this reenactment took place uh, on March 7th or 10th, 2020. What happened on March 17th? The nation went into lockdown. So you see thousands of people here. Out, they're all outside. It's at night regardless. But thousands of people huddling together to watch, including me and all this stuff, huddling together to watch the 250 year reenactment. And it's literally one week from national lockdown. So I, when I found that, to add it to this, so that's a hyperlink you see. No, 
I was like, oh my gosh, there was COVID right there. <laughs> like, you know COVID was there somewhere. Um, so, and the time is just fun. But it's it's cool. It's seven minutes long. They really keep it short. Um, but it's still kind of neat to see, like, a, a really cool and well-presented um, rain item. So, for the fan in the flames, again, fly through. In addition to cornering out, you have the Boston Port Bill, which closed the Boston Port, uh, which, until the colonists can pay for the damage to the Boston Tea Park, which... That I would love to see reenacted. I would totally love to see the Boston Tea Party reenacted. Do you know there are two crates remaining from the Boston Tea Party? Uh, historians have two of them that were part of that moment. All the rest, like, they're just, they're gone. There's the Administration of Justice Act, then the Massachusetts Government Act, and then the Quebec Act, yeah, yeah, yeah. So some of the additional causes, there was a central sense of national identity. If you guys recall a couple of weeks ago, do you remember the one event that really was kind of the impetus for the first, it was the first unifying moment of all 13 colonies? Wait, you wouldn't. I talked about my US history class. So the one unifying moment that happened about three decades before was the uh, Great Awakening. So the Great Awakening, if you guys don't know, just very briefly, was this great religious awakening in the American colonies. And uh, there are a few superstar pastors who literally went to all 13 colonies, spoke thousands of times before millions of people. The nation was only like, the population was only like 2 million. But pretty much everybody knew who these people were. And they gave thousands and thousands of sermons. And the nation, you know, the colonists, like really woke up, um, uh, hence the Great Awakening, um, in regards to religion. Well, that really was like the first time that all colonists, all 13 colonies really kind of felt this idea of like, hey, we, we're, kind, we're kind of a people now. We're not just British. We are Americans. Um, to which, you know, and so the isolation of the colonial period evolved into a spiritual, uh, or spirit excuse me, of common, in, common interest. Ben Franklin said, we had best hang together or we shall surely hang separately. Uh, so the colonies also had a really good postal service, which eased communication, allowed I mean, the, the woodcut of the Boston Massacre was basically in every newspaper within a week. You know, everybody knew this was, uh, this was, it was either wood or silver cut, I forget. But this was made the night of the Boston Massacre um, by Paul Revere, the night of the Boston Massacre, and it was basically in every newspaper within a week or two. I mean, so if the country was on top of the news. Uh, so because of that, Again, you have this kind of national feeling, but they also had national information. You can kind of share the same opinion, but it's just opinions and emotions. You had Patrick Henry's famous liberty of death speech, which showed a unity of purpose. Um, the revolution kind of technically can say it began in, 19, in 1760s with James Otis's protest against the rent of, uh, of assistance, which is uh, you know, legal non specific searches for shipped goods for contraband. The American colonists loved pirating goods. We still love pirating, don't we? I talked about Napster a few weeks ago, right? That was a big deal. We loved to pirate music. People still pirate stuff. Um, so it's kind of a thing of ours, I think, is stealing intellectual property. Well, kind of the same thing happened here. America's like, we're, we're pirating your our, you know, tea because your stuff is too expensive. Um, and then John Adams claimed that it was it began in the hearts and minds of Americans with the Stamp Act in 1765. Uh, so there were no avenues of redress of grievances because there was no representation in the parliament. American believes Americans believe that quote we had always governed ourselves because they had been isolated. They just kind of had this overhang of the king and parliament. The revolution has been called conservative, but it, it's simply conservative because of the idea of conserving individual value, individual rights of destiny. It was truly revolutionary, though. This kind of war had never been fought in human history. And so if nothing else, the revolution pro produced the most profound political document ever conceived by man, that being the Declaration of Independence. This was a big deal, and this declaration would be copied again and again by other nations, by the peoples, attempting to achieve what the Americans have achieved. And then finally, their isolation, the Americans' isolation from the mother country during most of the colonial period it developed a spirit of common interest. Um, again, the colonists were wealthy, well-to-do. They weren't hungry. Um, there was decades of changes in social, family, religious, and ethnic conditions that underlined the traditional deference to authority. Again, I, I cite the Great Awakening, Great Awakening. And during the French and Indian War, legislatures had become, in their own eyes, little parliaments. 
which kind of just meant those little parliaments were our parliaments. They were representatives of us and improved the American colonists to do it on their own. So, what say you? When did the American Revolution end? In 1783, when the war formally ended with the Peace of Paris. In 1789, when the Constitution was ratified, which formally brought to the planet for the first time a true democratic republic. In 1800, with the first peaceful transition of power that took to take place between two political parties. So uh, George Washington and John Adams, the first two presidents, were Federalists. So the first two you had the Congress was basically Federalist, which just means it was kind of like a modern day Lawrence case D Democrat. In 1800, uh, Thomas Jefferson would be a modern day conservative. He and his conservative, uh, and he and a conservative legislature swept through the government, and we had this peaceful transition of power. The government flipped on its head from kind of centralized government to more states' rights for the first time. Or D, the revolution is still going on to this day. Socialists and stop your neighbors. Grab your go. By the way, if you're watching this on video, you have to explain why, too. I'll just say A, B, C, or D. I'm going to fill out an answer. Shirt, so let's go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we got two revolutionary shirts here, really. All right. So, who said A, the revolution ended with the war? Okay. I said A because I think the overall goal of all this was just to see Hypothetically, George Washington could have become king. He was kind of hand of the government on a silver platter, or hand of the country on a silver platter, because he was the face of it. Um, and so he would become the face of it. So hypothetically, yeah. And a lot of people kind of expected him to do it. Uh, and so if he had just said, okay, war over, I'm in control now, I'm king. It'll, you know, sure, we might have broken off from a king, but now we would have had our king. You know what I mean? So hypothetically, yeah, I mean, like at that point, it, you know, at least he's our king and not someone else's. Who said two with the peace of Paris? Mark Huckham. I said because I wrote a what he said is like we wanted to separate from England from the king, and I think when we made our own constitution. Everything we did up to that point was like 
years old. Oh, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so the first one, I, my bad. I meant, so yes, with the ratification of the Constitution. Oh. Not the piece of Paris to say. So yeah, no, you're correct. So I want to just clear two with the ratification of the Constitution. Yeah. I, really, I think that really wanted to so we established our own government. Yeah, so I mean, the rest was the, the war's intention then is the government. And so the government was the, the, the design of the government that really gave the people a chance to decide their own future was the catalyst, was the very good. So who says three with the election of 1800 and the first peaceful transition of power? Madison, how come? Um, because it goes further than just like a writing on the paper of the Constitution. It shows that like it can actually work. And then after the first action of peaceful transition has been accomplished and you know it works, then it ceases to be revolutionary status quo. Oh, fascinating. I love, I love the way you phrase that. So with that first transition of power, then it ceases to become a revolution, it becomes status quo because, quote, because hey, now nothing works. We can kind of flip our government on a dime. And believe me, the government, the governments between Washington and Jefferson are you know, diametrically opposed in many ways. So it really was a changing of the government. Very good. So then who says D, uh, I don't know where to, it is still going to this day? Nobody? <laughs> you can argue it. Yeah. How, how, could, how could you argue? I could argue that just because of the way our constitution is written, it allows for amendments. Like it, it allows us okay. to constantly change it. You know, if something needs to be taken out of it, even though we haven't taken out really the nineteenth amendment, the eighteenth If you take away the nineteenth amendment, you're gonna make yeah, half of the class yeah, really upset. Sorry, eighteenth <laughs> 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 Uh But. You can argue that it's still like the American experience is still going on today. Like we still have that same sort of fire. Like we don't like what's going on, so we're going to change its attitude. Sure. And very okay. So very good. So you spoke specifically, and obviously you said you could make an argument, uh, but you spoke very specifically to the fact that we can change the, the constitution itself. But moreover, we can change the government. Um, so I argue D. Um, because if you think about it, Joe Biden, much like John Adams to Thomas Jefferson, Joe Biden politically is nothing like Donald Trump. And Donald Trump politically is nothing like Barack Obama. And Barack Obama politically is nothing like uh, George W. Bush. Um, and so, and I could go on and on and on. The thing is, is that we now, now granted, we really don't have much of this in terms of like swinging back and forth. We don't. There isn't some middle line anymore, or middle area anymore politically. We tend to just swing one way or the other. But Joe Biden freaking swings hard left by comparison to Donald Trump, who swung hard right compared to Barack Obama, who swung hard left compared to George W. Bush. He didn't swing hard right. He was he wasn't as far right as Trump was, but I mean certainly farther right than you know than uh, than uh, say Obama or Biden is to the right. So. We, change, uh, we have a mini revolution essentially once every four years. And actually, it can happen even more frequently than that because if you flip the leadership in the House and or Senate, now you're also flipping the direction of that aspect of the government. And so one of the great conundrums of the 2020 election was the fact that Joe Biden won, and you can argue the election only won, but statistically, Joe Biden uh, won by a fairly large margin. I think it was six points. So it's a pretty big swing. And yet, the Republicans nearly took control of the House in a, 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 you know, a series of races that the Democrats were told or were predicted to actually expand their lead on. So the good chances that the Republicans are going to take control of the House in 2022, and that is historically so. Only the 2002 election in the last like 30 years has the president's party actually gained seats in the Congress. Traditionally, the president's party loses seats in midterms. Um, and so historically speaking, especially in the fact that the Republicans nearly took control of the Senate, of, of the House, excuse me, the odds are they're gonna push forward and take control in 2022. That's gonna flip that part of government. I mean, like, it's absolutely gonna flip it. So 
I argue personally that the revolution is still going to this day because we have constant changes in our government. The structure of it stays the same. But again, as I think it was Madison and argued, um, you know, as soon as we proved that we could change the face of the government, then you know the status quo took status quo took place in that we, we could stay peaceful. But at the same time, it also means that ideas are still changing and right radically. I mean, Donald Trump's brain and Joe Biden's brain are not on the same you know, issue when it comes to certain topical positions. And they were diametrically opposed in many ways. And so too are most Republicans versus Democrats in both the House and the Senate. Now, there's also one other option I didn't put up because I know we picked it, but like option E is there was never a revolution. This is all a computer program, we're all in the matrix. But I'll leave that up to you to decide privately whether or not. Yeah. So what are you the American Revolution is still going on today uh -huh. rather than just having individual uh many revolutions per se like for your states? Yeah. Why are you the American Revolution still going versus just new ones? Oh, 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 I see what you're saying. Okay, so why argue that it's one continuous revolution versus minimum? Because if, if you contemplate that a change of government as dramatically as we tend to do can be the impetus for the losing party to revolt, can be the impetus for, especially if there's ever a question of the integrity of the election, that right there, that's the end. And, and, that's, and if we ever get to a point where we, we reach that, where the losing party, um, or even if it's the supposed losing party, or, or there's a question of integrity of it, it'll all fall apart and there will be a, a rush to govern, a rush to, to change. Therefore, I, I'm kind of looking at one. We have always been on a precarious line of, of um, whether falling into revolution again or kind of maintaining the status quo. It really has never been this like, oh, we'll never go that way. It's always been there. And I think 1861 kind of proves it that it didn't take a whole lot for 13 states to go, yeah, we're out of here, peace, and war to break out. Um, so because of the nature of the government, because of the nature of, of kind of the beast of democracy, I don't think that we're like strongly standing on firm ground of peace. I think we're towing the line and it's a consistent tow. And so because of that, it's kind of, the revolution is continuing because it could flip. It might not take as much as we think it, it should, uh, even based on the arguments that we had earlier in regards to um, why we haven't had a revolution in the last hundred years. It might not take as much as we think it could but to blow the whole thing up for this country to really just go, okay, that experiment is over, it died, we need to do something new. And maybe originally we need to do two or three or four new things. And, and you know, the you know, kind of the land that we have organized now is one nation that comes forward. Kind of, I mean, I'm not saying it will happen, but that's the thing. I think we're kind of towing the line because it's such a volatile system. You know, part of the revolution too is the acceptance of volatility. We left a system that really wasn't volatile because we just had a king. Or they had a king. And it was just kind of the king's way. And just and when he died, his son took over. There was no like question of, of who's next. It was that's not a very volatile system. Our system is extremely volatile. And so because of that we're kind of towing that line. Uh, yeah, I was gonna ask it Given the whole Biden administration and all that, do you think we can face potentially see a revolution or a civil war in the next couple of years? Next couple of years, I mean, how how much of a stark divide is between both sides? Do I think so? In the next couple of years, I don't think so. Would I be shocked? No, just because I think right now a lot of people are scared. I think a lot of people are scared. Um, and then the question becomes, as Ian was discussing. You know what percentage needs to be scared in order for something dramatic to happen. Yesterday, I was watching, looking into some polls, um, like um, basically how both Democrats and Republicans used to view uh, the president, mm -hmm. how they agree. And usually, every president uh, before Barack Obama was at like thirty percent, then Obama was like forty, then Trump was like seventy-eight, and then Biden. What are you talking about in terms of those percentages? It's, it's basically a percentage of. Um, the difference between how both parties feel the legitimacy of, of the president. Okay. And like how they agree about the president. So usually the disagreement was around 30. And then with Obama, it was around like 40. Then with, 
was Trump was like 70 something, and yeah. like Biden is like 80 something. So the start divide seems to be a growing even. More. Yeah. So like I said, I mean, I think there's a, I think it could take less than we might think for a revolution to happen, or at least if not a revolution, something very, very dramatic, something to make the storm in the capital seem like, you know, nothing. I think it might take less than we might think. Will it happen in the next couple of years? I, I, it's hard for me to predict because I don't know what could be a catalyst. However, I will say this, do I think the United States is kind of like a Chinese state of its eternal, like it's just gonna kind of be around forever? Not a chance. I think, again, it's because of that volatility, um, that the, the, the nature of the government and of that change and the nature of how we live as so far quite fairly independent individuals, um, that either the government gets to the point where people will just be too scared and will kind of something will happen, or the government gets to the point where it will literally have to to, to secure its own power, it will really have to turn on the people, which will then lead to. I, I just I don't I don't think it lasts forever. Uh, and actually, I kind of wonder if it's a beautiful experiment that will actually be the thing to set up the next great government somewhere somewhere down the line too. Um, but do I think that in a hundred years will be exactly you know be still solid? I actually don't think so. But I it's purely guessing, you know, on my part. I certainly have no evidence to. Well, I think I have evidence, but I, I don't have anything solid to, to state. Next couple of years, though, I think probably not. But again, I, I don't think it's when that does happen. I don't think it'll be as much as we think would, would be necessary for it to happen. So we'll see. I mean, again, right now there are a lot of scared people. So. All right, well, well, that took longer than I expected, so how about I spend a little more time on, on the American Revolution and a little less time on the French Revolution? I'm just trying to flip it the other way around. But we also have some fantastic conversations, I love those. So the ancien regime, which is one of my favorite two words in any language, I just when I say them, ancien regime, I just sounds cool to me. I remember taking French history in my undergrad, it was a class of mine as a history major. Um, and it was fascinating when I mean, the French are kind of nuts in this part. Fun. Um, but I just remember my teacher who spoke fluent French, you know, would say those words, but I just love the sound of it. But anyway, it just means old regime or ancient regime, that kind of thing. So the old regime, the ancien regime, was the socio political system which existed in most of Europe in the 18th century. And then, as the countries were ruled by absolutism, essentially the tyrannical dictator monarch, the law was what the king said the law was, the law was what the queen said the law was. And that was it. And it was just because, remember, the divine right of kings that monarchs were in charge of government because God placed them there, and they were groomed and educated to know that, hey, I am the successor, I am the next person who is put in charge of this country. And that's all they know. They're not told, you know, hey, this is kind of a system, but it can change. They're told, no, this is the system. You're in charge of the country. The law is you. You are the law. And so this is the old system. And then you had a division of people, which was really like, there's no such thing as middle class. There are the haves and the have-nots, the privileged and the underprivileged. The underprivileged people paid taxes and were treated pretty poorly by the privileged. And the privileged people did not pay taxes, thus were able to better retain their wealth. And, uh, and certainly, you know, excuse me, kept their wealth simply because they were wealthy. That was it. You know, hey, you have wealth, you can keep it. Oh, you don't have wealth, let me take more of it. I mean, the system was totally cockeyed. Um, and those privileged people were therefore treated better. So there were three estates in England in this old ASEAN regime. Um, and they varied widely in what they contributed to the terms of work taxes. So the first estate was the Roman Catholic cl clergy, which had developed quite strong. Uh, they had a developed uh, authority there in France. France at this time was just a Catholic nation. So it's a Roman Catholic clergy. They made up only 1% of the population, and they were a privileged class. They were exempt from taxes, as in the United States, I mean, Christian organizations, religious organizations tend to be, if you follow certain rules, to basically be exempt from taxes as well. But they're exempt from taxes, 
They owned 10% of the land from for which they would collect rents and fees, and bishops and other clergy could grow to be quite wealthy. So that's the first mistake. And why would they be first over another? Because they were closest to God. The second mistake was the nobility. They were a little bit larger than the population. They made up a less than 2% of the population. They too were privileged. They paid few, if any, taxes. They controlled, however, much of the wealth. So while bishops and other clergy in the Catholic class, the first estate, could be quite wealthy, they weren't generally going to be anywhere near as wealthy as the nobility. And they would then hold key positions in government and the military, and they lived on country estates. These were estates that were owned by the government, and they didn't have to then pay taxes on. It was kind of gifted to, again, hey, you're wealthy, your family is wealthy, therefore, here you go, here's some benefits. Have you ever seen like uh, an entertainer, a rock star, a, a, an athlete or something going to a store, and they're basically like given stuff? It's like, oh, hey, you're wealthy, you know, like, here, here's free stuff. You know, you kind of think, well, they shouldn't they pay for it if they've got more money than the rest of us? But no, they're kind of like, oh my gosh, you know, uh, Michael Jordan just walked in here. You know, here, you want to just take them. It's, it's on the house kind of. Well, imagine, it, so I do know that firsthand. I used to work for a sports store when I was in college um, that no longer exists, but it was with one of the top two biggest sports stores in the state at the time. Uh, and we would have athletes and entertainers coming all the time. And essentially it was like, oh my gosh, it's so and so. Like, you're looking at that, you want it? Here, it's yours. And like the management would just be like free gifts to these wealthy people. Well, imagine that now on a nationwide level. Imagine those people too. Oh, you're famous? You don't have to pay taxes. And here's property, thousands of acres. Take it, it's yours. And it's just, oh, you're, you're, you're so special. Then the third class is the largest group, the third estate. They make up 97% of the population. These people are known as the bourgeois or the bourgeoisie. These were the, the merchants, the factory owners, the professionals. There was the sans lot or the artisans and the workers. And then there was basically everybody else, which made up the largest percentage of even the third estate, which were the peasants, poor with little hope of ever breaking out of their position of poorness. Um, paid rents, fees, higher taxes. But overall, this group of the third estate were the unprivileged class. So what did the king do? And again, this is an absolute monarch. He controlled everything. His word was law. And they were born and raised and taught that this is your position. He appointed the intendants, or uh, I think they were intendants or petty tyrants who governed France's 30 districts. He appointed people who would collect his taxes and carry out his laws. He controlled justice by appointing judges who would do his bidding. He controlled the military. He could imprison anyone at any time for any reason. These were known as blank warrants of arrest called lettres de cachet. And he leveled all taxes and decided how to spend the money of the government. He also made all laws, and he made all decisions regarding war and peace. So, absolute modern. The time France's economy was heavily based on agriculture, and peasant farmers bore the burden of France's taxation. Poor harvests over several years meant that peasants had trouble paying the regular taxes and certainly could not afford to have their taxes raised to make up for the losses the government was having. Now, the most important part about this, you know, just in regards to the history, is the fact that their main food source, the peasants' main food source, is bread. And, it was, and it's been bread, and bread has been a central part of the daily life of the French for centuries, and it's actually only ending this kind of, this, uh, you know, if, if we want to use bread as kind of like a, a metaphor for the Frenchman, it's really only kind of ending in the last couple of decades. Like, literally, the early 2000s is kind of when this, this idea that going to the bakery every morning, getting fresh baked bread that's going to be your part of the three meals you got that's kind of dying. It's because young people, you know, as we were talking about earlier in terms of technology and, and, and personal goods, they're like no longer wanting to become bakers. They're like, or bakers, excuse me, they're like, I want to play video games. So baking is dying. But regardless, there were several years of poor wheat harvests that was then producing less bread 
which therefore, because of scarcity, is raising the price of bread. Well, now peasants aren't able to afford as much bread or to get the amount of bread that they had been sustaining on. They're then not able to afford the goods, and they're really getting broke. Well, there was not a whole lot of shared information by the government as to why the price of bread was going up. They weren't saying, hey, we're having kind of hard times in terms of uh, poor harvest. It was just, it was nothing really said. So people, these peasants, started thinking the government, the government was being raising the prices to pay for more things, uh, which, you know, virtue, by virtue of taxes, or the nobility must be hoarding it for themselves and not letting enough for us, leaving enough for us at 97%. So then all of a sudden, there starts to come this question, what the heck is the government nobility doing? Because we're starving to death, and they're ready to for us our prices. So these bourgeoisie often managed to gather wealth, but were upset, so, oh, of the bourgeoisie, those, again, it was like that kind of upper, lower percent, uh, they were upset, though, when they had to pay taxes on it, but the nobility did not. So France goes bankrupt. And again, France is going bankrupt. The price of food is going to bread. Everything was going up. And yet there's nobody really sharing information with the people. So King Louis the Sixteenth lavished money on himself and residences like Versailles. And then Queen Marie Antoinette was seen as a wasteful, wasteful spender. She spent obscene amounts of money on her hair, which, by the way, I'm not going to click on it, but again, when you go back to look at this, if you want 10 facts about Marie Antoinette's, Antoinette's hair, like, if you're like, wait, what is it, what? No, there's seriously, this is interesting. Check this out. That's like a three-minute read, but it's seriously 10 facts about Marie Antoinette's hair. You'd never think that anybody's hair would cost as much as hers did, but holy crap. Uh, governments found, or the governments, excuse me, found its fund depleted as a result of wars, the American Revolution, which really was the American Revolution, put them in bankruptcy. Then the government started deficit spending, and this is when the government spends more money than it takes in from their taxes. Uh, and then the privileged class would not submit to being further taxed. So you really start to get into this great national controversy, national national debate over what the heck do we do over money and how do we deal with these problems. So again, as I was saying, bread was going up. The amount of money spent on bread by the peasant, the percentage of their income, went from 60% in 1787 to 80% in 1788. They were starving to death. They had no other money, and they had no idea why bread prices were going up. Uh, so during this time, we're also going through the age of enlightenment and the age of reason. Social political scientists uh, during the Renaissance had discovered laws that governed the natural world, and intellectuals, known as philosophies, began to ask if natural laws might also apply to human beings, in particular to human institutions such as governments. In the United States, as we discussed on Tuesday, well, heavily, I mean, Thomas Jefferson basically plagiarized John Locke in the Declaration of Independence, John Locke being one of these great. Enlightenment for thinkers. So philosophies, though, were secular in thinking. It was how to, how to create natural law and societal organizations without God. How to do it simply among men. And they attempted to use reason and logic rather than faith and religion and superstition to answer many of these important questions. And thus they used reason and logic to ter determine how governments should be formed. Rather than divine right of kings, that God placed a family lineage in charge of controlling a nation, they tried to figure out what logical, rational principles would work to tie people to the governments. So that whole process is going, and eventually everything comes to a void. So some of the short-term co uh, causes of the French Revolution was everything already discussed, absolutism, fact that kings were law. Uh, the unjust socio-political system of the old regime and rich, you know, the wealth, the, the excuse me, the general populace made up ninety-seven percent of the population, and yet kind of shared or had lesser rights than the top three percent. Uh, poor harvest, which left many peasant farmers with a little money for taxes, and yet they weren't really told what was going on. And of course, the influence of the Enlightenment, also the system of mercantilism, which restricted chain trade. These uh, people were not allowed to export with England or, or Germany or anybody else. Uh, the influence, or the United States, influence of other successful revolutions, i.e. England's Glorious Revolution, 
And of course, the just finished American Revolution. Oh, those are long term, excuse me. The short term are the bankruptcy, great fear, the worst famine in history, hunger, impoverishment, attacks on nobles, uh, and then the estate general. Now, this is fascinating, the estate general. If at all is an interesting word. What is the estate general? Well, it was a legislative and consultative assembly of the three different French estates. Each estate had a separate assembly and that included the clergy, the nobility, and the commerce. And the estate general was called to start and then dismissed by the king. So the people, I mean, there could be a movement to call for, it was just up to the king to, to finally call it to session, but then it was up to the king to tear it down. And the reason for this is they were consultative. The king, the, the purpose of it was that the king would call to order the, this is an estate general and just say, okay, we've got this problem, like how do we deal with it? And in this case, it was the debt, it was bankruptcy, the national bankruptcy. And so then three estates were going to come together and say, okay, well, we're going to do this, we can figure this out, blah, 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 blah. And then the king would then just decide whether or not to accept it because they were going to say, okay, king, this is what we're doing. Because remember, it wasn't the people's word that was law, it was the king's word that was law. So if the people of the three estates said, we'll come together and do this, the king would have just said, yeah, well, I'm not going to do that. So, okay, never mind, we're done here. I'll figure it out myself. And then boom, it was over. So... Uh, it served simply as an advisory body to the king, primarily by presenting petitions from various estates and consulting, in this case, on fiscal policy. So it had been called for the, for the spring of 1789, uh, in which members of the three estates were elected representatives, or elected representatives for each of their estates. The cashiers were the list of grievances written by the people. They, this is the third state, 97%. They asked for nothing out of the ordinary and asked simply for moderate changes to just kind of help them out. Raise taxes on somebody else, lower you know, our taxes, help us you know, import more grains, we can have more bread, lower the price of bread. Like, you know, come on, man. These aren't difficult solutions. Once this was held, people thought the revolution was over. We can fix this right here. We have an estate general. It had not, an estate general had not been called in 175 years. And they figured that's a big deal. Therefore, once this is held, we can be done. Here's the problem the first estate of clergy had one vote for 130,000 citizens or clergy. The second estate also had one vote, the nobility of which there were only 110,000 people. The third estate also had one vote for 25 million people. So could the first and second estate, who were the wealthiest among them and taxed the least, just say, yeah, well, you're not raising our taxes, third estate, deal with it? Uh-huh. Guess what they did? So here was, this is actually from the day, it was May 5th, uh, 1789. So kind of the anniversary. So there's King Louis the 16th. Here's the first estate on the king's right. Do you know how, you know, when, when Christ dies, died, he, or when he went to heaven after his death, he went to the right hand of God? Because the right hand is the dominant hand. It's, you know, if you were left-handed, you were often kind of considered evil or whatever. Well, so the clergy is on the right hand of the king. The second estate or the nobility is on the left hand of the king. The third estate or the working class was in the back of the hall. 25 million people and are given the worst seats and treated the worst, treated as second class almost. So Voting was to be conducted by each estate. Uh, in this case, the first and second estate could have operated as a block to stop the third estate from having its way. So they did. And the king really didn't help out his subjects who were basically funding his extraordinary lavish lifestyle. 
representatives then demanded from the third estate, demanded that the voting be by population, which would give the third estate the great advantage. Because they're like, listen, we're not asking for a lot, but you're not going to use your, you know, presumed power to stop us. So a deadlock result. Results. What do you think happened? Positive change occur or something bad? The king was afraid that his power is going to be restricted by a new legislative block created by the third estate, kicks the third estate out of the estate general and attempts to resolve the issues with the clergy and nobility alone. Thus, would this be a fair, would this be fair to the majority of citizens? Hell no. So what do the commoners do? Well, the third estate declares itself, by the way, anybody ever watch um, How I Met Your Mother? There's a couple of times when they play a song that's this like total heavy hair band from the, from the 80s, and they sing a song where you get the lyrics, murder, all upon the murder train. I literally, I hear that <laughs> when I repeat. When I read this out loud, I hear my head, murder, all upon the murder train. Because what do the commoners do? They go nuts. Third estate declares itself a national assembly. King Louis XVI responds by locking the third estate out of the meeting. The third estate relocates, though their representatives, relocates to a nearby tennis court where its members vow to stay together and create a written constitution for France. The king did not want to read the constitution because that would limit his power. And again, this guy is raised this entire life going, you're the center of the French universe here, so like your word is law. And now here are a whole bunch of people going, yeah, no, no, we're going to take your power. It doesn't jive. So on June 23rd, 1789, King Louis XVI relents. He orders the three estates to meet together as the National Assembly and vote by population on a constitution for France. So here's the image of the tennis court oath. And it says, quote, the National Assembly... Considering that it has been summoned to establish the constitution of the kingdom, to effect the regeneration of the public order, and to maintain the true principles of monarchy, that nothing can prevent it from continuing its deliberation in whatever place it may be forced to establish itself. And finally, that whosoever its members are assembled, there is the National Assembly. Decrees that all members of this assembly shall immediately take a solemn oath not to separate and to reassemble wherever circumstances required until the constitution of the kingdom is established and consolidated upon firm foundations, and that the said oath taken, all members, and each one of them individually, shall ratify this steadfast resolution by signature. All right, I'm going to skip this question so we can get it. All right, so what are the four phases of this ring on fly of the French Revolution? So there's the National Assembly which leads into the Legislative Assembly, which leads into the Convention, which leads to the Directory, that when that falls, leads into Napoleon Bonaparte becoming Emperor. So the National Assembly, of course, King Louis XVI did not want a constitution, he's been forced. However, when news of his plan to use military force against the National Assembly reaches Paris, people stormed the Bastille, as I shared that story. Um, there's an uprising. People seized the weapons of Bastille on July 14th. Uh, and the Par Parisians organized their own government, which they called the Commune, and then small groups or factions competed for control of the city of Paris. Uh, there would be an uprising, nobles are attacked, records of feudal dues and taxes are destroyed, many nobles flee, and uh, eventually King Louis XVI is forced to fly the new tricolor flag of France before he then bolts as well. So changes under the National Assembly, the abolishment of guilds and labor unions, the abolition of special privileges, the brand new constitution of 1791, the Declaration of Rights of Man, which is kind of like the 10th, the, the, um, Declaration, the, excuse me, the Bill of Rights in the United States, although it also has nothing to do with women. It truly is a Declaration of Rights of Man and Women in Justin Man. Uh, equality before the law, again, just for a minute. Many noblesses leave France and become known as a measure. The reforms of local government, taxes levied based on the ability to pay, and they rid the country of religion. They literally renamed the days. To avoid any Christian reference, they renamed the months to avoid any Christian reference, and they extended the work week to 10 days, so that way there would be no habit of, well, 
God rests on the seventh day. Well, you don't. He rests on the tenth to end the kind of any and all connection to God. Uh, and they told priests not that they can't get married, but that they must get married under penalty of law. That if you don't get married, then you're still married to the church because that is the essence of priest becomes married to the church. Uh, that's why they're not allowed to marry uh, a Catholic priest. That's why they're not allowed to marry women. It's because women, woman, because they're married to the church. They're told, no, 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 no. You will marry a woman, so go find one. Um, then the Declaration of Rights of Man and the Citizen, freedom of religion, although it really is like freedom from religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, guaranteed property rights, liberty, equality, fraternity, unless you're a woman, uh, right of the people to create laws and right to a fair trial. So it's the end of special privileges, it's the Constitution. Uh, so the royal family seeks assistance from Austria because uh, Marie Antoinette is Austrian, so you know, like there's kind of your natural connection. So she uh, is told by her, actually her lover, uh, get out of here. Like, go to Austria. You'll be safe. The you know people will call us, and the army can come back, and yada yada. So she convinces King Louis the Sixteenth, we gotta go. So literally one night at midnight in 1791, they take off, they flee, and they're literally only caught mere hours from Austria. However, they fled in a massive royal carriage that can be recognized by anybody instead of taking smaller carriages because they didn't want to break up the, the royal family. Um, the, the carriage could pretty much be noticed by anyone. Now, they weren't... Um, nobody really knew faces. It was hard to know a face because they didn't have television, they didn't have cameras. But it was actually, I think it was a, a, a guy who works for postal service in a town just a couple of hours from the border who recognized the king's face from a just a document that just kind of had his, his side profile. So he rides off like a bat out of hell to the next town. He gets the revolutionary army up. They stop the king and they send him back to Paris and it's all over. But, so they fled this mass royal carriage that could be noticed anywhere, and they got out constantly to refresh their horses. So they were constantly stopping. They ended up, they actually had a, a small band of military soldiers that were going to be there to, at one point, farther outside of Paris. They were going to uh, kind of like help escort them. But because they were so late getting there, because of all these stops they kept making, that the soldiers got freaked out and they just they disbanded. So they didn't even have this guard. So I like to just joke because of that, they're, they're idiots. They literally could have gotten out of town, changed history, but instead, it didn't happen. So nobles also fled, and they were able to get out most of the time. Church officials wanted church uh, lands, uh, rights and privileges restored, but they didn't get it. Political parties represented different groups emerged, the Girondists and the Jacobins. Um, European monarchs feared the revolution would spread to their country, so France was actually invaded by Austrian and Prussian troops. Uh, and the uproar of the commune took control of Paris, and then they actually fought back and won this war of um, the, these, they fought back the opposition, the military opposition, I have it. The Ford Coalition, that's right. Um, they established the First Republic. You, of course, I don't get into it, but you, of course, have the, um, the reign of terror in which, like, literally 200,000 people are beheaded. King Louis XVI is guillotined on January 21st, 1793. Marie Antoinette is guillotined just uh, nine, ten months later. Her, her daughter is allowed to go because she could not become queen because of Salic law, which did not, did not allow females to succeed the throne, so she lives. But the king's son, Louis Charles, uh, who lived in prison, was eventually killed as well because he could potentially, hypothetically, raised back to power. So it's just a terrible, terrible mess. Uh, what else do I want to say before we go? It's my mother's attention. Approximately 15,000 people died of the guillotine, became known as the National Razor. 300,000 people were arrested. I mean, it's a mess. Like I said, it's kind of fun. So, all right, let's look at the sign before we go. Oh, shoot. Hold on. I need to make that change. I want to be able to get to the assignment.
All right, so just a reminder, the third assignment is just three quick parts, really two parts. Uh, one is you use the matrix below that I have there, and by the way, it's just a doc. You just literally download the doc, and the doc, how you need, and uh, uh, attach it back to LabFound. Use the matrix below to compare the views of thinkers listed regarding the source of political legitimacy and the rationale of the government. So you discuss Paul, St. Paul, uh, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Thomas Jefferson, and you discuss their positions on the source of political legitimacy, as well as their rationale for obedience to government. Then you're going to pick two others. I've mentioned another, you know, others in the Tuesday lecture, um, but you can, I mean, you can go in and you can pick anybody that you want who discuss the source of political legitimacy and the uh, rationale for obedience. So you got to like kind of choose your own adventure here. So you do those. It's like 25 to 50 words per, you know, per box. So it's not a whole lot, and I just require one citation per row. Because presumably, where you find source political legitimacy, you're also going to find the rationale. And therefore, you don't need to cite each box, just one citation per row. Then the second part is just two prompts that you just use this to answer. So what is the purpose of government? Provide three different views from your matrix. You're going to choose three that you want and identify the author of each, to view, uh, each view in your answer. 300 to 500 words. Include citations. Uh, and then why is political legitimacy important? Who or what provides a government with legitimacy? Then use support from the matrix and course materials and answer this question as well, 300 500. So very, very straightforward. Basically, once you fill this out, it essentially kind of answers these two questions entirely. You don't do additional research for these, you just pull straight from the matrix. Here is the range from the textbook. This will help you with all of that. Of course, you've got the lectures as well as the secondary readings and then the UC library too much of the full. Um, and then again, if you have any interest in anything, and that we discussed today. We've got three books there The Glorious Cause, The Creation of the American Republic, uh, Citizens, and Chronicle of the French Revolution, documentaries you can find online, um, The Revolution, Liberty of the American Revolution, and The French Revolution, that's my name. Uh, movies, The Patriot, John Adams, Les Mis. Uh, and then, like, I like to like kind of podcast lectures. So I also had it for this one lectures, which are all on YouTube. You just literally search those. So, French Revolution 2017 History Lecture Series. Six Maximilian Robespierre in the French Revolution, and then the coming of terror in the French Revolution. So, just kind of additional reading or, or additional information if you want. Let me take notes and we can do that. Any questions, comments, concerns, patient switches of any kind? No. Who has, who is done for the day? How good, who's done for the meeting? How good doesn't have anything tomorrow? That's what happy does. Sweet. I have a five o'clock, and I don't have any classes tomorrow. Like, it kind of sucks that I have to teach five o'clock because I'm always hungry. <laughs> but I don't have anything tomorrow. I at least they don't have classes. Obviously, uh, Alani? Amir, Andre, here. Autumn, Basil, here. Bernice, here. Danielle, Destiny, Dylan. Elijah, Esteban, here. Gabriel, or Gabriel, here from Anna, Hayden, here. Ian, here. Isa, Jace, here. Johnny, here. K, 
Kelsey, Lauren, Lucas, Jude, Luke, Madison. Here. Uh, Silva or Wall? Silva. Okay. Is Madison Wall in here? Uh, Michaela. Here. Mark. Here. McKenna. Here. Uh, Nicole. Samuel. Sydney. Sierra. Here. Uh, Sterling. Sydney Doral. Talia. And Zoe. Did I miss everybody? I love y'all. Have a great weekend. Be safe. Have fun. Read a book. Read a good book on the French Revolution. I'll see you next Thursday. Don't get notes on Tuesday. Check that sweater. I got it on Amazon. It's like 30 bucks. What? Yeah. 30 bucks? I gotta look that up. I love that. Oh, it's even got a name. Is it? Yeah. It's O'Callaghan. O'Callaghan. Okay. Gotcha. Goalie, right? No, he's a, he's a Okay, okay. I forget, yeah. So.